I mean, my big. Um... I got a phone call. Someone from Farsi is, uh, is an old friend of mine. He was very upset. He wouldn't answer. The three kids had disappeared. Likely they've gone over to Syria, and I have to help them. Did you ever think, you know what, this could be a show? No, it was already a media circus, orchestrated by the British police. They wanted her back. Now, all of a sudden, they don't want her back. When did that shift happen and why? Sandra Javed, she's having a baby. That baby is a British citizen. We want to go and bring that baby back. Will you help us? Answer was out of silence. Did you have to deal with MI6? Or, yeah, or... Um, we... If we are looking to our politicians for moral fiber, you'll end up with uh, constipation. If I wanted to invest in your company, would you be open to that? Viewers, a bit of a context in terms of who Taz Akunji is. Why don't you take us back in time as far as you can remember? Okay, well, I'll start with Asalaamu As Alaikum. Wa Alaikum As Salaam. I should say, in fact, I should say As Salaamu As Alaikum to you. Wa Alaikum As Salaam. As far as I can remember, well, I would say, that's when I was two years old. It's one of my earliest memories, I guess, is being in Bangladesh in the Gram um, and uh, playing animal husbandry with the, with the animals there, I guess, or riding a goat. That's, that's my, one of my first memories. <laughs> riding a goat? <laughs> You must have been very small. Uh, yeah, I was. Uh, and I remained that way. <laughs> Mashallah. So, you were born in Bangladesh? No, I was born here. You were born yeah, here? Yeah. So, okay. I must have not been listening properly. So, you were born here. Mm -hmm. And then, how did you end up in Bangladesh? Uh, my father decided that it's probably sensible if my mother and uh, myself were spending more time in Bangladesh in the early years. You know, mm -hmm. as, a, as a child, you're either in the UK or you're... Uh, elsewhere, you're not at school. And I think my mother was quite young when she had me, and uh, her adjustment to the UK wasn't as uh, wasn't as easy as it is today. There was no family there, no extended family, and very few um, people from our background, given my father used to travel around the country. So um, it was more easy on my mother for her to bring me up a little bit in Bangladesh and then come back within a year and a half. Well, what was life like in Bangladesh? I mean, apart from riding the goat. Well, I mean, that's my only real memory from that time. There wasn't, there wasn't many, many others. I was only two years old, so wow. I think um, that's quite, that's quite surprising because two-year-old remembering riding a goat. That's quite incredible because I can't, I don't think I remember as far as two years. Probably six, seven years. Oh, really? What's your greatest fear? I would say um, leaving this world. Um, worse off for my children than I haven't found it for myself. I'd say that's my greatest fear. Care to elaborate a little bit more? Well, as a, as a parent, you, you want to do and give you opportunities to your children that are better than the ones that you had for yourself, uh, if not at least the same. And I think a lot of us feel now that uh, we live in a world which is moving in a direction that really we can't say that that's the type of world we're leaving for our kids, be it opportunity-wise, economically, or even more importantly in terms of global safety. Now, um, many of us from a from a background in Bangladeshi or in many other parts of the world, we come from families that have travelled because of war and conflict. They travel and were lucky enough to travel to a safer part of the world so that they could have safety for themselves and their families. And when I look at the world today, I can't see a corner of the world that couldn't quite conceivably be within imagination fall within a lack of safety. So where our parents had an opportunity to go from one place of non-safety to a place of safety, I think the world is becoming a place where that's harder and harder to contemplate. Do you believe in justice? Yeah, we all do. Um, every single human being does. Whether they try to uh, give life to it or not, I guess it depends on which political party you're affiliated to, and most of them, justice is something that's sold, I believe, but uh, every human being believes in justice. It's more important than actual food. So does justice exist in this world at it's the a, moment? <clears throat> if justice didn't exist, the world wouldn't exist. Um, so we do see a lot of horror on our TV screens and we see a lack of justice. 
But if it weren't for the fact that human beings care about each other and do right by one another on a day-to-day -day basis, this world simply wouldn't exist. So we, we live in a world that's based upon a lot of fiction. Um, tomorrow, the idea of tomorrow is a fiction. The idea of money is a fiction. The idea of owing someone something is a fiction. But it's an agreed fiction. It's something we all make real. And on a very basic level, if we don't give life to the truth of these fictions, then there is no justice at all. Our, our society would fall apart. There is justice. It's just when we talk about it, we often talk about it in terms of a formal process of justice. And um, justice requires resources and it requires a will for it to be done and be seen to be done. And unfortunately, in the context where we're living, uh, justice is becoming less and less important on a formal basis than it has been or the idea of it has been when we were growing up. So, on a one being the best and, I don't know, 100 or whatever being the worst, which country, in your opinion, in this world, in this day and age, has the best justice system? Well, I haven't been lucky enough to travel every country and haven't been naughty enough to have found myself you know, <laughs> dealing with uh, the justice system in every country. Um, I will still say that the rule of law is a good indicator uh, of whether or not a country has a rigorous justice system. And um, we still find that in Western countries, the rule of law is still a fundamental tenant of society. Um, it means, and you can often follow it in terms of investment, companies wouldn't invest in countries if they didn't think they could secure their investment through the core process. And so you'll find that um, you know companies do still invest in the West, um, and those justice systems that exist here, we have a high standard because we live here. But when you travel around the world, you find that many quote-unquote justice systems are very easy to manipulate and are very politically compromised. And that still is something that in the West and in Britain, that's not got so uh, problematic for the average person leading the average life. Do you think there is a different justice system for money and there's a different justice system for average Joes? Yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, that's been the case everywhere uh, for all time. Yeah, in terms of access to justice, if you are relying on a state-sponsored system, which um, is having to cater for the needs of, in this country, 67 million people, at a time of extended austerity, you're going to get a very limited amount of resources allocated to you, which means that you won't have investigators, there's no money for that, there's uh, little money at all for the lawyers involved. And so your ability to avail yourself of the skills needed to defend yourself is limited. It's there, but it's limited. Um, if, however, you have, you know, let's call it not infinite resources, but um, enough resources that you could throw in the direction of lawyers, accountants, forensic scientists, uh, investigators, um, then, yeah, you, you will have a much greater chance at defending yourself against accusations than um, if you rely purely on, on state resources. So if you have money, then you have justice. If you don't have money, then you're kind of screwed. I would say that, that, that I don't think that's quite accurate. I'd say that if you have money, you have a greater ability to affect the outcome in any justice system. So, um, you know, if you, if you throw a million pounds at a problem and someone else can throw eight, 8,000 pounds, you're more likely to get a much more favorable outcome. Um, if you have a million pounds thrown out a problem, then, then a small number of digits. So in that context, purely in that context, then justice in itself is compromised, right? Because money can manipulate certain outcomes. Maybe even, even investigation, better investigation, better results versus a guy who has been maybe wronged and he can't access that justice. So on that context, are there any countries in the world that doesn't have a privatized, in my opinion, a lot of the Western countries are privatized justice systems. Mm -hmm. Are there any other countries in the world that has a fair system where they look at things for as it is, right versus wrong? Well, there's a lot, a lot of uh, aspects to that. As it is, is the exact reason for why you have a court, why you have investigators, why you have rules of evidence. Because that's the thing in dispute. What is, what is as it is? One guy says X and one guy says Y. And in order to test where the reality of the situation lies, that's where you have a court system to allow through rules evidence. Now, in terms of civil courts, let's say not the criminal ones, 
The whole thing is privatized. It's privatized everywhere. It's uh, one body, one group are suing another group, and both of them don't have legal aid, right? They both have to either defend themselves or or get lawyers to do so. That's normal across the board. Really, when we talk about state defense, it's when the state oppresses an individual and or potentially oppresses an individual, and that is most likely to be found in the um, criminal justice system. So a- access to justice is always going to be about access to resources, and there's no way around it. If you if you wanted to have a system that could um, factor out an individual's um, p- access to resources, what you'd have to do is have one of the most incredibly expensively funded systems on the planet, and that's not the function of a state. A state's job is to look at all the problems in society and allocate appropriate resources to that, be that healthcare, education, defence, what have you. But And justice is part of that. It's a very important part of that. It's an expression of our sovereignty. Um, but it's still an element there. There's no point in having justice if you don't have food for the people. Obviously, Islamic justice system doesn't exist in this world anymore, does mm, it? It does not, no. It does not. And the British justice system or judi- judiciary, how do I pronounce that word? Judiciary? Uh, yeah, judicial system. Judicial system. Mm. What do you think of British judicial system? I, I will say that my experience with it has been th- mainly through the criminal justice system. And overall... Over the years, I've seen that actually it does come to the right decision in many cases. Not not every case. There's always a there's always a situation where you, you feel that a jury has convicted somebody maybe maybe without unfortunately having access or fairly even to all the evidence. But overall, a jury system does actually get down to the number of the matter. Overall, it tends to be quite quite good. Interesting. Um, we'll we'll talk a bit more about the criminal um, mm-hmm. law side of things that you practice. Um, there's a lot to discuss because I just find it very fascinating mm-hmm. um, how the justice system works and how it seems to be privatized and you know how there's certain help for certain people, but mm-hmm. then again, there's no help for other people. Like for example, mm-hmm. from a growing business perspective if you're a small to medium sized business there's a there's always a void where you know you can get shafted you can get screwed around and for you to pursue someone is quite expensive so a lot of people a lot of business people they do get shafted along the way so yeah um, we'll discuss um, further down the line in this episode are you an introvert or an extrovert to be honest, I'm the last person to be able to judge that. I'd ha- I'd have to say that uh, yeah, I I'm, I tend to mix with people, so uh, I wouldn't say I'm introverted. Okay, do you do you have to be careful on what you say as a lawyer? I think all of us do. If you if everyone said what they thought all the time, there'd be no such thing as marriage. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. So, criminal law. Why did that attract you? Why specifically criminal law? Well, it's where things are as as high stakes as it gets. It's about a person's liberty, and it's also about where the state interacts with someone's life. It's generally it's um, it's where you know someone's going to go to prison. That's a lot more important uh, than whether or not someone has a bit more money or a bit less money, uh, given in terms of a deal they may or may not have done. Um, so that yeah, that's what attracted me to it. It's 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 often in extreme situations where criminal law is is applied, it's where human beings have often failed in uh, in how they have interacted with their fellow human beings, and there's a limit to how much failure can be tolerated before it crosses a line, and it's always interesting about what that line is in a given situation. Because what what could be unreasonable in one on one day in one situation is utterly reasonable in another. And I'll give you an example of that. Murder is wrong, killing a human being is wrong. But in the context of war, where our soldiers take out another soldier, that person's called a hero. So it's exactly the same act. It's taking the life of a human being. But in one case, you're the one of the worst people that can possibly work, walk the uh, planet. In the other, you're a hero lauded by your culture. That's all context, and that's what makes it interesting in terms of 
what is the context to a given set of human behaviors. And do you think this is another way for you to exercise, I guess, your intelligence, you know, your capability as, as a lawyer, where you, you know, work through a case and, you know, you make progress, you present the case and then you win ultimately. Is that, is that something that satisfies you a lot when you have that victory? In, in the criminal law, what's really interesting is that you're looking at very academic points, like in any area of law, but then you're having to translate that through a system so that you communicate to a jury of your peers, 12 people, and they are people who are just your neighbours. You know, they're not academics usually. And so you're taking something complex uh, and then you're making it and making it simpler for people to understand, and that's very attractive. Now, in terms of when you, um, whether you're exercising your skill or not, Everyone has their intelligence that becomes um, honed by practice. And the best thing to do is to find where your skill sets are in life and to try and build a career around those skill sets. That makes you happy in its exercise. You know, if you enjoy the work you do, then you don't work a day in your life. You just are enjoying yourself. And that, I think, is, uh, is something that really people should try and do. And I enjoy my work, certainly. Um, and so I, I can't say... I can't say that I've worked too much, but I've certainly enjoyed myself in my career so far. Amazing, amazing. So, so criminal law is one thing, mm -hmm. and then you specialize in people that have been labeled as terrorists. Yeah. Why specifically that um, niche? Um, well, when I graduated, that was uh, back in 2000. And literally the next year, yeah, the, uh, the Terrorism Act came into force. Now, that was after 9-11 and what have you. Um, and the Terrorism Act was fascinating because it, elements of it turned a thousand years of English criminal law on its head. So it, most people think that you're innocent till proven guilty. That's true. However, to be found guilty um, in normal criminal law, you have to convince the jury beyond reasonable doubt that somebody is guilty. In terrorism law, there are elements within it that say that, no, you can be found guilty on the balance of probability, which means that on a civil basis, but the burden's on you to prove your defence. So the, the burden shifts from the prosecution uh, to, to the person accused, which is rather interesting. And there are offences that are known as strict liability offences where you, you basically have no defence for them. So the accusation's enough. Um, that that intellectually is fascinating as to why you have a, 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 a specialist niche of laws for a particular group of people um, that, that flies in the face of, of tradition um, and why it is that these sets of laws were needed for a so-called group of people when the, you know, the uh, UK had the IRA threat, which was a very real terrorist threat, and these sort of laws didn't exist for, for that conflict, which ran on for 100 or 90 odd years. So it was attractive because it was very different um, intellectually to, to what existed before, and no one was doing it. You know, people just weren't, a lot of lawyers didn't, didn't want to take on that work. Um, so you, you start doing something because it's interesting, and then because you've done a case and no one else is doing it, and suddenly people are beating a path to your door because you've got some experience in something which is very new. Interesting. So, you know, criminal law. The label itself, it says criminal law. Mm -hmm. But then again, you're a defense lawyer for a criminal law or a, a criminal that you are already kind of labeling as a criminal. How does that sit? You know, defending someone who's labeled as a criminal. Well, it's, it's, it's the accusation, isn't it? So... Um, the person is accused as, but isn't a criminal until and unless they're convicted or they plead guilty. Right? So um, what, what is the defence lawyer's job in, in, in criminal cases? Our ultimate job, actually, our, our function for society is to be a, a bar against um, the state becoming a, fa a fascist state uh, because the worst possible thing is oppression, is where a state that has all the resources and our resources, that gets its resources through taxes, then uses that to just, you know, put people away without any basis. So our function as defence lawyers is to test the evidence 
to show and to make sure that the state has the evidence and the truth behind the accusation they put on someone. Obviously, our, our, that's our overall function. Um, our other functions are to advise our clients um, so that they get the best possible outcome. Now, most scenarios, that means, you know, somebody would want to say that I've been accused and the best outcome is to be found not guilty. But if the evidence shows that the person did what they said they, uh, what, what they're accused of and also that they had the intent to do so, our function becomes to advise them to uh, probably plead guilty in those scenarios because the evidence is overwhelming. Now, we can't make them do that. That's their choice. But they run the risk that if they don't follow the advice, then they'll get um, a much worse sentence. So it's up to them. We only advise. Um, but it doesn't mean that you, you're always trying to uh, get someone off who might be guilty. So because your your job is very kind of complicated, in, in, my, in my view, it's quite complicated. Maybe to you, it's, it's just very simple. If, if you know, in your heart, you know someone actually did something, mm. would you still pursue in terms of defending them? Or would you say, you know what, I don't want to be involved in this anymore. Maybe you want to go to someone else. So to know that someone did something means that you were complicit because you would have been there. Yeah? But we weren't there. So our job is to believe our client. It may be that we think that what they're telling us is very implausible, very unlikely, but we are duty-bound to believe what our client says. So there are situations in life that are incredibly implausible, but they happen. You know, Our job is to look at the evidence and advise our clients based on the evidence. So what our heart says is, uh, is, is not relevant to the situation. What is relevant is what our client tells us happened, for us to believe it, and then forward the best possible case based on what they've told us to the court. And how does that compare to Islamic um, system, you know, where, where, where someone is brought to justice mm -hmm. and Islamic defense system? Is this quite similar or is that quite opposite to each other? Well, I think in terms of the Islamic system, it's much more inquisitorial, it's judge-led. So it's more like the European model, um, which they practice on the continent. In the UK, we have what's known as an adversarial system where um, a court is a little bit more passive and you have the, the prosecution and the defence that are treated as having inequality of arms, and then they duke it out um, in front of a jury, like a bit of a tennis match, and then um, the jury then decide. That's entirely different to an Islamic system. In the Islamic system, you have a judge who's asking questions, and I guess the lawyers in that scenario are assisting the judge with answers to those questions. Um, in, in the UK criminal justice system, the judge doesn't ask very many questions at all. Um, and it is, it is more led by what the prosecution allege and then how the defence responds. It's quite Did you ever contemplate on becoming a judge? No, I haven't. Is that something that you would ever consider or, or it just doesn't kind of excite you? It's, it's not that it doesn't excite me. It's something that I wouldn't consider. Um, when it, when it comes to being a prosecutor or a defence lawyer, you've got a very clear sort of side. You, you know what your uh, aim is. A judge has to look at things in a much more balanced way um, and has to look at the rules rather than the, the substance. And that's not necessarily something that, that, ex that excites me. Um, it's a very important function, um, but I don't think uh, my disposition lends me towards that profession. Do you think sometimes judges you know, make decisions or judgments even though where they think, according to the law, I should be doing this, but I feel that's the right thing to do in this context. I think all human beings do that. Um, I think a human being will get a feeling about a situation and then interpret the rules in a way that lends towards that direction. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as they're within the rules. So I think that's just a function of humanity. Interesting. So now... You're famously known for representing a very, very publicly high-profile case. Um, everyone knows Shamima Begum and, mm. and was it three sisters that they, they ran away to... Three to girls. Yeah, three they, girls. They weren't, they weren't related. Okay, three girls um, ran away to, to Syria and they were, of course, labelled as terrorists. Um, I don't know if they're terrorists or not, because I don't know enough about them, and I'm hoping you can educate us and our viewers. What made you take that case on? 
The uh, communications officer of East London Mosque is what his name was Salman Farsi at the time. I was in uh, in Finland in 2015. I was giving lectures at the university there, and I got a phone call. Salman Farsi is uh, is an old friend of mine. Um, we've gone through quite a lot together, and he's never asked for for anything. Um, and he, he I received a call from him. He was very upset. Um, he was on the edge of tears. I was asking him what was happening, and he he wouldn't answer. He said, he said, um, I'm going to ask you something, and you have to say, you have to agree, you have to say yes. So I, you know, rather non-loyally way, he said, <laughs> he said, yes, of course, anything. And then he explained what it was, that these families had, uh, had lost some, the three kids had disappeared, likely they've gone over to Syria, and I have to help them. So I flew back, and... Um, that's where the journey began. But it was it was him. It was uh, a so Salman Nasser. Farsi made a request to mm. for you to take that case on. If yeah. they approached you by themselves mm-hmm. or the families, would you have taken it on? I would have, yeah. Okay. Um so what happened? What happened? I mean, how did the story unfold from the from the moment where you accepted the case? Was there any monetary dealings involved? No. The the families were look, the, 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 there wasn't a case initially. Right, it was advice okay. because three girls had disappeared. Um, the families needed advice, and there wasn't a case. No one was arrested. Um, but the reason the families needed advice is because there's some very particular laws around what you can and can't do in terms of assisting somebody in the context of a uh, of a war that where they may be seen as terrorists. So normally, if you've lost some kids, you would spend your money to get those kids back. Maybe if one of those children rang yeah. you and said thing is, in this context, if you do that, you could be committing a terrorism offence itself. Of, um, oh, hell. <laughs> so there's specialist advice that's needed around what behaviours can and, and should be done, and also around what what should be disclosed to the media, for example, at a particular time or not. Um, when I was contacted, this matter had already been in the media. Uh, the police had made the decision to put the families in front of the BBC and make a call and an appeal to bring the girls back in our experience. That's a very So they wanted the girls back to try them in the UK? No. Or, they, or why? Just wanted, uh, in 2015, it was a very different context. So the police, well, it was a missing persons case. Okay. They uh, weren't looking to arrest them or anything. They just, we had some 15 and 16 year old girls who disappeared. Okay. And so the police were looking to bring them back and re- bring them back to their families. Um, after a certain amount of time, when the context was quite clear of what, what was happening, we negotiated with the police and they put in writing to us that if the girls were to return, subject to there being no evidence of any other crimes, they would be treated as victims, not as anything else. So really up until 2019, up until Sergeant Javed's involvement, um, no one had stripped any of these girls of any of their citizenships and they were the, the UK authorities were framing them as victims and... They did not stand in our way when we tried to get at least Khadija Sultana back. How does it work? Well, how do you go and negotiate with the police? So um, in this particular case, it was quite a unique scenario. Um, the, the girls' families were not getting much information from the police. Um, the police turned out to have known that their daughters had gone off to Syria, but they didn't tell the families. And when something like this happens, there's what's known as a police liaison officer, uh, a police officer or a civilian officer who tries to explain a situation to to the families. But the families were getting more information from the news than they were getting from the police, and this is making them very upset. Um, at one point, the police were very keen that they didn't get a lawyer, and each of the liaison officers for the families called the families when they heard that uh, I was getting involved, and we happened to be in East London Mosque at the time, all the families and myself. The police called them individually and put them on speakerphone. And we, wow. we heard the police say, <coughs> don't, don't get a lawyer. At which point I took over that conversation and said, I want to speak to your line manager. This is you know, completely inappropriate advice. And I had a, let us say, private conversation with their line manager, explained a few things, and then he asked us to, or myself to come into Scotland Yard I gave him an indication of what I thought I knew. 
he got concerned and then said, what do you want? And we then said, <laughs> what do you yeah. want? Just like that, yeah, what is it that you want? <laughs> and uh, we ended up in, in, in Parliament. Uh, I said I wanted a public declaration uh, and an examination of what's happened. Um, and then Keith Faz at the time facilitated a, a uh, committee hearing. Um, they brought the, uh, uh, the Turkish ambassador in also to clarify mm -hmm some differences of opinion between our police force and what they'd actually communicated to the Turkish authorities um, at the time, which the Turks actually had a very different version of uh, events on. At any point um, in time, during those uh, initial phases, mm -hmm. did you ever think, you know what, this could be a show, this could be a like you know, media circus, you know, where, oh, it where was they need... No, it was already a media circus. I mean, it was Did they plan this? Sorry. Did any authorities, any anyone from the British side, did they make so what make came, a show out of this? Well, certainly the the entire show was orchestrated uh, by the British police. Uh, the whole thing, them going away, or no, no, the, the the part no, the, the, after the, that? Yeah, the part where there was uh, advice to the families to go on the news and to talk about their daughters having gone missing. That was a police suggestion. That was before our involvement. The reality is, is that where something is, uh, where it involves terrorism or war, the last thing you want to do is go to the media. The very last thing. Um, countries and their rules are different. Obviously, we have different rules in Turkey, the different rules in the UK. And where, um, where a country may well be interested in helping on a humanitarian basis somebody, they will not be able to do anything other than follow the rules extremely strictly when the cameras are on them. So when we were speaking to the Turkish authorities, they, they thought that we were involved behind getting the, the thing into a media circus, and we said, absolutely not. Um, you know, we, we've dealt, dealt with these sort of things before. We know that these things are best dealt with quietly, and we're convincing um, you know, members of the security services or the police or the army uh, to do a humanitarian thing. But they can't do that when the cameras are on them. That is like some next level... Um you know, um, discussions, you know, where you can piss someone off and result for those victims could be completely different because someone during the phase or during the research or in conversation, they tip someone off. I mean, years later, we discovered that um, a Canadian asset, uh, so a, a spy working for the Canadian authorities, was the person who trafficked Shamima Begum and the other girls across the Turkish border. So Canada is part of what's known as the Five Eyes uh, Intelligence Sharing Network, which is the UK, um, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and America. So that's one of our close allies, and we, and we share intelligence. The idea that the Canadians trafficked her across the border without us knowing it becomes difficult to swallow. Um, so we, we have to wonder uh, what elements of our security services were aware of their location. Uh, we know the police were not aware of where they were and we understand why the police um, would have encouraged the families to to put a call out for these girls um, because by the time they've flown over into Turkey the UK authorities have very little uh, ability to, to interact with their movements um, but one has to ask that question about our security services what do they know when and why would the Canadian authority want to traffic them I mean what what, what was their motivation <laughs> So ISIS were, um, you know, they're, they're an organization that was mostly uh, composed of very senior officers at the senior level of Saddam's um, intelligence corps. So they were very experienced intelligence officers who'd come out of a very brutal regime, Saddam's regime as well. Um, and they had also got elements from Al-Qaeda's own network. So the, these are extremely experienced sort of clandestine um, trained individuals. And they were very difficult to penetrate in terms of spy networks. Uh, our theory is, and it's a theory, is that because they were so difficult to penetrate, the security services of Western countries had to only you know, put their spies at a very low level and hope that the war would kill off enough of the high-level people so that they would, then be, uh, they would then be promoted through the ranks. But to be noteworthy within a terrorist organization and to be promoted, you have to do something useful for the organization. So we think, uh, or my theory is, is that the Canadians had their fellow there. Uh, he would bring in people and resources for ISIS. 
he'd be noteworthy and he would then be promoted up the ranks, basically. And I imagine this was happening across the, the board. <laughs> wow. This is um, crazy. Now, well, War is a very strange that activity. Is, that is madness. Now, were you ready for... So before Shamima Begum case, were you, were you in any, any shape or form in media? No, uh, well, not, not really. I try, tended to avoid it. You tend to avoid media. Mm-hmm. Now you, you, you're going for the complete opposite, where you're going into a, I guess, a show, a but, massive show around the world. So look at where we are. Yeah, when I, when I was growing up, I there was racism and things like that. That wasn't specific to our community. But you felt that you had a fair shake of the stick, that what you said was heard. Now, since 9-11, which is an event that took place thousands of miles away to another country called America, who, you know, have got their own imperialist ambitions around the world, not, theoretically should be nothing to do with us. Because some terrorists blew up a building in America, what's that got to do with the UK? I can't see what what the direct connection is with the UK, but the UK changed its entire criminal justice system in order to, you know, uh, deal with the terrorist threat. Nothing happened in the UK at that time. So what was it like? So coming from you know non media kind of um, operations where where you practice your law where there is no camera around, there is no one asking you questions. Now, presumably, you had to ask uh, answer a lot of questions from various media outlets. What, what was it like? Were you trained? Were you ready? Or did you think, oh, no, I shouldn't have said that? You know, or, or how, how did that play out in front of you? Because it must be daunting. <coughs> I mean, you didn't have a choice. <clears throat> well, we, we were thrown into the limelight. There was already the cameras uh, everywhere pointing at these families. I mean, there, there were journalists popping out of bushes with cameras outside some of these uh, families' houses. And it, it, it was actually ridiculous. So, you know, politicians get a bad rap in terms of uh, moral behavior. Lawyers get a bad rap in terms of moral behavior. But just wait till you meet journalists. <laughs> They're another level. Um, of course, you know, there, there are things that you say at the time which you think with the information you have... Um, would be helpful. But then they get spun, and they maybe get spun uh, on the day, that's in a positive way, and then years later they get spun in a different way. But you can't control the spin. You just, all you can do is employ your intelligence and your experience and deploy and hope for the best. So Salman mm-hmm. Farsi, obviously, he's a communications officer. Mm-hmm. Did he give you some media training, say, hey, you know what, avoid this, you know, say this, or was there any direction from him? Well, no, I don't think anyone had had been in that situation before. Um, he was certainly helpful in terms of knowing which journalists to maybe avoid. And and he was uh, very helpful in terms of being able to tell us which journalists are more trustworthy and honourable. Um, but that's about the only steer that was possible there. I mean, if you, well, we, we had journalists from South Korea who were coming in Japan. We, we, don't, we don't know who they are. Um, and yet they're pointing cameras at people and asking questions. So do you think the media, obviously media, they want they want news. They want news that will be read and will be watched. So c- there's commercial benefits at the end. Mm-hmm. Do you think police, um, they wanted the media to know? Um, maybe it served a few different purposes. You know, one, bring the girls back. And another one is make some money while you can, while you're at it. No, I don't think the police are uh, motivated that way. You, you'll see when the police release information, it's because they're looking for actual information. So the police are, you know, very mature in this country. Everywhere around the world, we call them police because they were named police here. Um, and so they, you know, they only release information when they feel it's important for the progression of their investigation or outcome. Now, I can see why the police would have, in this case, thought um, with the information they had at the time, which, you know, they, the security services don't always talk to the police. In fact, sometimes they do the opposite. Um, but I can see why the police thought that maybe there was a chance that these that with the public, you know, um, pronouncement that these girls are missing, that if that was big, a big enough splash, that somebody in Turkey or the Turkish authorities would be able to act in time. That wasn't the case. The girls had already 
disappeared across the border by that, which in itself was unusual in the efficiency. But we can see why the police thought um, the way they did. And actually, apart from the failures that the police had before the girls left, in that they had questioned these girls um, without the permission of their parents, in that they left letters with the girls to pass on to their parents, those were failures and the police have accepted that those were failures. But um, in terms of their thinking around making this into a bit of a circus, yeah, we can't blame them for that. But there are questions of our security services that need to be answered, I think. So how many parties were involved in this whole... Uh, as, uh, as I presume it's still ongoing, that the cases, and, and have you the stopped acting for them? or No, I still represent the family of Shamim Begum. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So how many stakeholders are involved in this whole scenario? So you've got security services, right. you've got the police, you've got the lawyers, mm-hmm. you've got the family, you've got the mosque to a certain extent... Uh, to say, well, one would hope that um, that our politicians would be involved. Uh, you know, these are f- these are four girls, particularly. There were more than that who were at risk, uh, and they came from a, a school called Bethnal Green Academy. You know, you would have thought that the politicians who were responsible would be very interested. And who was responsible at that time? Well, that we had Rushnara Ali, who was the MP, and we had John Biggs, who was the mayor. Um, uh, just at that point in time, you know. Okay, so, and then how many more parties? So politicians, politicians, well, well, they turned their back on, on yeah. the whole situation, maybe because they were told to, do you think? Did, did you ever consider, maybe there's higher authorities no, giving we, them instructions? We, 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 we have heard from Jacob Rees-Mogg, who came publicly on, in 2019, very much against uh, the the core of the conservative sort of uh, minister, ministers and politicians saying very clearly that he believes Shamima Begum um, should not have had her citizenship sh- stripped by Sajid Javed and that she should be returned to the UK. He's actually said that more recently as well. That's Jacob Rees-Mogg. Um, we've also had Jeremy Corbyn, Diane Abbott, a num- raft of other people um, who've been very much against the idea of stripping a British citizen of citizenship. So there were plenty of politicians involved. We've had other politicians who were saying, you know, hang her by the rafters. Of course, um, very unpleasant. So the politicians weren't involved; they didn't no, no, they, support. You see, they, the thing is, some of them were, and some of them weren't. Okay. Yeah, but what was important, what was notable by her absence, is that the MP for for Tower Hamlets, <laughs> which for we will discuss. Yeah, there's a lot w- to talk was about. Was not involved. And yes. You would have thought, well, look, these are your. These, th- this is the worst case. This is your constituent, effectively. Yeah, this exactly that. And this is the worst case of ch- radicalization in the Western Hemisphere. In the Western Hemisphere, anywhere in the world, what? And people don't want to know how this happened. They don't want to learn their lessons from that. And the politicians who were directly, you know, in in charge of the the safety and uh, duty of care for their own constituents have turned their backs on the issue or want to stay silent on it. Other politicians are speaking. Why aren't you? So... During the 2015, 2016, 2017, when, when, when the case was very kind of public, mm-hmm. who did you have to deal with? Who else did you have to deal with MI6? Or, yeah, or? Um, we... <laughs> yeah, the, the, Are you allowed the, the, to say certain things? I, I'm, no, I'm trying to remember. Okay. Right? And, the, and the reason I'm trying to remember is there are conversations that I had that were private and I don't break... Okay, uh, so you need to maintain yeah. the confidentiality. Of course. Um, there are other conversations that I have um, agreed not to speak about because I don't have my client's permission to okay. speak about Fanta. Okay. So when, when I'm pausing to think, it's because I have to think whether or not, A, I have permission to speak about it, or whether I myself agree to terms that uh, would mean that they were uh, confidential. right? And, and this, of course, is a lot of conversations that were confidential. So do forgive me if I pause to think what I, you know from nine years ago what I can. Of course, talk of about. course, of course, mm-hmm. um, and and it's understandable. And of course, we respect confidentiality and mm-hmm. and anything that can affect, you know, jeopardize someone else's freedom, mm-hmm. someone else's rights, right to live. Um, well, the, the question was about stakeholders. Yes, yeah, stakeholders. So there were there were there's a number of lawyers who were involved. Uh, we have our own team at the time. There was five of us there. And when it came to the stripping of citizenship, we, we'd been working pro bono with uh, Shumia Begum's family. We managed to get her case, her challenge against the decision to strip into court. At that point, she was entitled to legal aid, and we did not have a legal aid contract for this. 
So the case was handed over to for her uh, to Gareth Pierce's firm, Bernberg Pierce, and they've been representing her since then because they have a legal aid contract. So um, there's that law firm, stakeholders. There's us who represent the family. There's various, I guess, media. Um, she has spoken to a lot of new journalists over the period of time, very ill-advised in, in our view, but uh, she has, and therefore they have a stake in pushing a story as well. The security services are definitely involved. Um, and when we think of the security services, we, we think of GCHQ, MI6, MI5. But when you, when you appear in court in dealing with these issues, there are about 23 or 24 other stakeholders. Because when you share intelligence, when one country shares intelligence with another, then their, their security services are also involved in, 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 that, in that matter as well. So, uh, you know, even even a dot or a comma in terms of what's disclosed is poured over by many, many different levels of security in this, in this country. Do you think they were actually trying to help them out or ultimately just, just there for the sake of being there and, you know, maybe ultimately it's, they realise, hang on, this could serve a different agenda, so let's push it for that, for that agenda. So when you say they... Yeah. They as in... So well, you mentioned Canadian, yeah. So so they is not one person, and they change as well, okay. and they also change their mind, you know. Um, so in the beginning, I would say that most of the they, the police, the government, were very much on the side. The story was let's help get these girls back if they can, and, and they did not stand in our way. And, you know, we were communicating what we were going to try and do. We were communicating to the Turks. The Turks were very, very helpful with us, gave us as much access as uh, a surprising amount of access. Um, and effectively, what they were telling us is, the door's open, do your thing. If you can get them back, great. We're not going to stand in your way. We will even give you some help if that's possible. Um, and they honoured that. Now, there's another they, which I believe are elements within the security services, who were doing a different thing, you know, or at least knew about a different thing that was going on. What do you think that they wanted? What did they want the, 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 from the, this? There were um, this this Canadian spy. Um, he had trafficked over 130 people. Some are saying, is he like a private contractor? Who, he was. Who just yeah. Does so he's a, yeah, he was a Syrian uh, dentist who um, had negotiated with the Canadians that he would operate in this manner, and the deal for him was that um, if he did this work for them, he and his family would be would be getting Canadian citizenship. And we've learned last year that's exactly what's happened. He was arrested by the Turkish authorities, in prison for quite a while. When he was released, he's now in Canada and uh, disappeared off into the ether. Wow. So before we wrap up this Shamima chapter, mm -hmm. how did she come in contact with these people, The whoever invited her to go to Assyria. How did the, did they ever tell you okay this is where it began and that's how we, how the conversation developed? So uh, if people cast their minds now a long time ago but 2014 um, you know ISIS were a new organization and they were creating a protest state. They had taken a huge amount of territory and their purpose was to try and attract people to come to their I mean, you, you have three million Syrians who were running in the other direction. They were going into Turkey, Europe, wherever they could go, internally displaced millions of them. But ISIS's purpose was to create a state and they wanted to uh, attract people to it. So they had entire departments, um, entire warehouses full of people who were on social media pumping out propaganda, trying to attract young people to their cause, either to fight or women to, you know, basically be the housewives of those those uh, those fighters. Um, so that, that, that was the propaganda message that went out. That's what their purpose was. And they were relatively successful um, in, in attracting people from all around the world to their project. Now, that project failed spectacularly, and so we have the fallout of that now. But how did Shamima be? I mean, did she not at any point think, you know what, I don't want to do this, you know? Did anyone not know around her that she's going no, uh, through a phase in her life that where they can see changes in her attitude, behavior. So the, the problem is the age. You know, if you and I started behaving differently at the age that we are, people think something's happening in our lives. And they'd be right to think that. Yeah. But when you're talking about 15, 16-year-olds who by definition are going through puberty, 
changes are par, par for the course. Uh, strange behavior is par for the course. And so it's actually very difficult to attribute a change in behavior um, when you're talking about teenagers to any one cause or not. You know, you just think, oh, it's a, it's a, it's a phase, it's the hormones kicking in. So you must have spoken to her. How did the conversation go? I mean, I don't want you to give details of exactly what, what you spoke about, mm-hmm. but how does such a conversation go, you know, when she's in the other end and, you know, you're uh, trying to we, fight we, for her? We have never directly spoken to Shamim Begum. We've indirectly spoken to her when she was in the camps, um, which is, you know, very difficult to know whether you can trust all the information you're getting. Uh, but But... Communication with lawyers was only established with her after the appeal case, not before. Um, so in terms of where she was, there was a period of time uh, before 2019. We thought she was dead. Uh, so <laughs> what I can't get my head around is at one point in the beginning f- stage, they mm-hmm. wanted, they, as in the, the police force mm-hmm. and, and whoever they may be, they wanted her back. Now they've mm-hmm. identified where she is. Now, all of a sudden, they don't want her back. When did that shift happen and why? Sajid Javed, um, the Home Secretary Sajid Javed, that was the shift. So imagine these girls had gone over in 2014 and 15. Then all the way to 2019, no one stripped their citizenship. They were, the UK authorities and the police were in contact with the families. There was never a suggestion that, that uh, anything other than them being treated as victims would be the framing that the UK authorities had. Suddenly you have Sajid Javed, Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson is uh, is becoming ever more increasingly difficult for him to, to be the Prime Minister or continue to be the Prime Minister. And you have a leadership bit. And Sajid Javed was one of the contenders for which you know, thinking that he could become the, the leader of the Conservative Party and therefore the Prime Minister. Is that a way for him to show his loyalty? Hey, you know what? I'm Absolutely. That's that's what our, our that's our belief. Wow. I wrote it in a letter to him. It was published in the Times. He, he that was his political gambit. He just he, he used in my view he used that situation. He used that girl's citizenship and threw her under the bus to as as part of his bid to become leader of the Conservative Party and Prime Minister. Is a I mean. Is that how powerful it is? A guy in a suit, his words, you know, against exactly, yeah. all the evidences that you guys have gathered that are factual. That decision is still being examined in the courts. It's been examined in the courts for five years, you know, and it's gone to the appeal courts and to the Supreme Court, backwards and forwards. His decision is still being poured over legally. Hundreds of thousands of pounds are worth of legal aid, I guess, to her lawyers and also to the to the um, Home Office lawyers about that one decision. And that was an incredibly irresponsible thing for Sajid Javed to do, to use somebody, A, immorally, um, for his own purposes, and then, in doing so, um, causing, causing the very weakening of the idea of what our citizenship is. Because now we quite clearly have a two-tier citizenship status. There's either people who are born in this country with parents from this country, um, and if they did exactly what Shamima Begum did, they couldn't have their citizenship taken away. But because Shamima Begum's family were from Bangladesh and the age she was, her citizenship was attackable. So we've got two classes of So now she doesn't have a citizenship in the UK mm-hmm. or Bangladesh because Bangladeshi authorities, they're saying, well, it's got nothing to do with she, us. Well, she, she was never, uh, she'd never even applied for... She'd never been to Bangladesh. She'd never applied for a passport. She didn't even apply for a visa for Bangladesh. Do you think if Bangladesh government said, you know what, we'll take her in, do you think all this will come to an end? Um, if someone volunteered to say, you know what, we'll, 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 we'll do the right thing and we'll take her? Yeah, it probably would, to be honest. Yeah. But, so she's stateless. She can't move anywhere. Yeah, she is de facto stateless. Yeah, the, But the Bangladeshi government, uh, are, their position is she's not, Bengali. She was born in the UK. She's never been to the country. Um, she's not got any status there. And Britain created her. You know, uh, she was radicalized in the UK. She used a British passport to go to Syria. She used British pounds to buy the plot Tucker. She's got no nexus to Bangladesh whatsoever. So why should it's, it's, why should Bangladesh be forced to take on the problems that were caused by Britain or in Britain? That's the yeah, let's go back Why can't position. Sajid Javed say, do you know what? It was a mistake and and 
could it be that he actually thinks it's, it's the right thing to do? Or does he... In, uh, we don't know what's in his mind, if but Sanjay, we can only assume. If Sanjay Javed was the type of person who was morally uh, motivated and believed in doing the right thing, why didn't he come forward and talk about all the parties that were going on in 10 Downing Street, you know, when the rest of us weren't even allowed in during lockdown to go and bury our dead um, or stand by our family members in hospital? You know, Priti Patel herself at the time said, uh, and advised us all under lockdown, rat your neighbours out if they're breaking the rules. She didn't do that. She didn't talk about the parties and nor did Sajid Javed. So, I mean, if we, if we are looking to our politicians for moral fibre, I think you'll, uh, you'll end up with uh, constipation. Well, now he's no longer the minister or, or mm -hmm. is he anything in, in the Conservative Party? I haven't Pro followed, the, no. followed his movements. I think just a bad story about a failed politician is what he's remained. So why can't he just come clean now? I mean, if, let's say, let's assume Sajid Javid is watching us talking. What would you say to Mr. Sajid Javid? I think that your uh, soul is irredeemable, is what I would say to him. Because uh, what his decision led to was the death of a small baby. Um, it wasn't just about Shumi and Begum. It was her, she was uh, pregnant at the time. She gave birth. We wrote to him saying, okay, let's put, put aside Shumi and Begum for the moment. She's having a baby. That baby is a British citizen, right? That baby is at risk. There's an extremely high mortality rate in uh, Al Hol camp. We want to go and bring that baby back. Will you help us? Answer, resounding silence. Mm. We could not bring that baby back to the UK without paperwork, without an acceptance by the UK state that that, that child is a British and can travel, give us travel documents. And that baby died within two weeks of being born. How would you summarise all of this information to someone who just doesn't know or who just come to find out about this case? How would you summarise everything into maybe a, a few sentences? I don't think you can. I think you have to give it this. This this is a case about how uh, politicians and a state can oppress somebody for for their own personal reasons, their political careers, in such a way as to change the very fabric and nature of the citizenship of a country. You know, the, the, these are personal greed consequences that have led to the entire change of our, the dynamic of our of our country. And it, you know, the right wing press has been mobilized to demonize a girl. You know and to demonize anyone who's trying to support her. The country's split on this issue. There, people, this debate has been raging for a uh, full nine years, really. Um, how would I categorize that? Uh, in, in a word, incredible, well, irresponsible. 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 So no one's taking any responsibility of the, of the situation, and, and in fact doing more damage than... We will all die one day. And it is my belief that we are all judged perfectly. Nobody gets away with anything. Wow. Do you ever think, I don't belong here. I don't, I mean, at least if you were in Bangladesh or somewhere like, you can't be thrown away because do you have a citizenship in, in Bangladesh or do you have any, now that you've faced, you've seen that happen in front of you, do you have you ever taken any personal precaution, precautions for yourself and your family, like, you know what, they could throw me out any moment. Mm, the only citizenship I have is British citizenship. I don't have any other citizenship. Um, if you defend your clients, you feel confident that you can defend yourself as well. Wow. Now, obviously, I can see that you're not satisfied. More, rather, you're angry with the, with the political system and, and you have made... Um, a decision to go into politics. Mm. How do you know that they're not gonna they're not gonna you know push you aside, or how do you know that they're not gonna start campaigns against you because of your beliefs and and what you're saying in public domain? Because obviously, clearly, you're fully you're very dissatisfied with with the way things are. How do you think I mean, you're going to change it? Seventy one percent of the British public are dissatisfied about the way things are, particularly over Gaza at the moment. You know, and we've seen Prince William come out and say that, you know, a member of the royal family, uh, a very senior member of the royal family, say that he's dissatisfied with what is happening in Gaza. So one has to ask, when our politicians are meant to be a representation of democracy, 
when they're supposed to give the voice to the people? How is it that we have the Conservative Party and the Labour Party operating together against the will of the majority of the British people and against the will, of the express will of a member of the royal family? So the type of forces that are controlling these two parties, who are supposed to be opposed to each other, but they're actually working together on this one issue, what force is that that's more important than democracy? Which, who is that force? It's a lobbying force, it's money at the end of the day. We have, uh, we have 40% of the shadow cabinet in the Labour Party have been funded by pro-Israel lobbyists. And the last study that was done, an examination into the government, into the ministers, 33% of all ministers were funded by a pro-Israel lobby. So when you have a strong correlation between the percentage of our ministers, decision makers and shadow ministers being funded by a particular lobby, and there is a mystery, it seems, as to why our ministers are going against the will of the people, you know, it's one on one, is two, isn't it? So money, <laughs> money is the cause of, of this. I might have wanted to ask Epstein a few questions, but we can't do that anymore either. Wow. So who is that force? I mean, <laughs> is there a force? I mean, it can't be just random. I can't just go to, say, Rushan or Ali or, or someone in Labour Party say, hey, you know what, I'm going to mm. donate this money, you know, to you. Or, or is it as simple as that? I can just go and donate <laughs> money and, you know, I can start pushing my agendas. Or is there a systematic process and a lobby or force behind this whole it, it, It's not just money, because if it were, like, you know, Saudi Arabia's got plenty of money. Qatar's got plenty of money. It, it's not just money. It's also the history, the the uh, relationships that exist between some people and other. Now, if you look at all our main political parties, you have the Conservative Friends of Israel, you have the Labour Friends of Israel, and you have the Liberal Democrat Friends of Israel. You don't have the Conservative Friends of Saudi Arabia or Qatar or what have you, or, that, or these... Uh, and neither is that in the Labour Party or in the Liberal Democrat Party. So, and one of the reasons for that is because um, the Zionist lobby has been existent for a very long time, and the people who are there, they're not, they're not Israeli, they're British. You know, they were born and brought up in this country generation after generation. There's relationships there. So, yes, there's money, and it's not just money. It's also those relationships. Now, the last time we looked at let's say, uh, Saudi Arabia or Qatar businessmen buying a football team, there's an outcry because it's seen as a very foreign thing. Individuals coming from abroad controlling resources. Well, there's been an issue around that with respect to Russian businessmen controlling um, UK football teams and what have you. So some elements are seen as foreign and some elements are seen as, uh, let's say, more closer to home. And the Zionist lobby have been here long enough, um, in fact, germinated in, in, in Europe, so that it's not just that they have um, the financial resources uh, to push politicians in one direction or another, they also have the personal relationships, whereas uh, others don't. So what you're saying, they can twist it and say, do you know what, uh, Taz is being anti-Semitic. Hmm. How would, you, how would yeah. you counter that? Well, I think the, the phrase anti-Semitism has been overused to the point of being broken now. Um, it did me it did mean something and it does mean something and actually Muslims find themselves in a very difficult and bizarre situation where there is anti-semitism in this country um, anti-semitism is predominantly a European thing you know Nazism is a European thing Zionism was a European thing these are nothing to do with anyone else in the world right now anti-semitism is where people target members of the Jewish faith because of their faith Anti-Zionism or criticism of a state has got nothing to do with um, the faith involved, you know, the Judaism or otherwise. Most Zionists are not Jews. They're actually Christians or in America. So you can't be anti-Semitic, but you can be anti-Zionist. No, but should that, it's not just you can't be, you shouldn't be. You shouldn't be. But like, then again, not, you can be anti-Islamic or Islamophobic be, on the other hand. Being anti-Semitic is not part of our religion or our creed. Of course. Yeah. So in terms of how we as Muslims behave, we behave according to our moral standards. And what's bizarre here is that we have a great deal of affinity to the Palestinian people. And, uh, and we are demonstrating for the Palestinian people. And Muslims in this country find themselves being attacked as being anti-Semitic sites for, 
simply flying a Palestinian flag or making chants in support of the Palestinians. But at the very same time, we're also having to fight anti-Semitism because there are actually anti-Semites in this country. And we have to then say to them, we can't and we do not follow what you do because that's against our creed. We don't. We reject the right wing when they when they uh, are being actually anti-Semitic. So these lobbies, lobby parties, parties, they have been at work for for a very, very, very long time with a clear objective, clear agenda. If someone from, say, Muslim community or a group of Muslim people got together and said, you know what, we're going to create conservative friends of Muslims or Islam or, well, or Labour friends of Islam and Muslim, how how acceptable would that be to the party? No, there are there are um, organisations. Uh, let's say the Labour Friends of Palestine exists or has existed before, um, and there are uh, the the. Uh, uh, Muslim friends of the conservatives also existed or exist. I don't know if they still still do. Well, from what we see in the newspapers, they have not been very effective. No, they haven't. <laughs> see, Muslim friends of um, conservative, it's, it's just like empty. Conservative friends of Israel, that's allegiance. Like, you know, we're with you. Yeah, but Muslim is a, is a, is a religion. Yeah. And Israel is a country. So a country has power. You know, a religion is is not a political expression necessarily. So, I mean, if you had the, um, you know, Saudi friends of the conservatives or something, I would imagine that that'd be more powerful. There, there is a, uh, you know, a affiliation of Russia friends of uh, conservative friends of Russia. So, so there are clearly countries that are, feel comfortable um, creating organisations that that exist to lobby our, our you know our politicians. Um, but for whatever reasons, the the Muslim countries don't really have that power or connection or what have you, you know. And and I'm not particularly surprised. You know, a, a lot of the Middle Eastern countries they they're not countries in their own right. They're basically, you know, they're um they're f- effectively petrol stations with flags, aren't they? <laughs> really, um, they they are an emanation of a, a very limited form of statehood which is entirely dependent upon US or, or Western sort of uh, diktats. What's happening in Gaza, Palestine? I mean, I don't want to use the word Gaza because Gaza is just a city, right? It's, 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 it's not a country. So for me, I like to use the word Palestine because that's the country it's labeled as, as a country. So a lot of people use Gaza, save Gaza, save this. It's like save London, save London. No, we, if, if, if this country is under attack, then save England or United Kingdom. Mm-hmm. So on that basis, I like to say, save Palestine or, or the fate of Palestinian people. Do you think this is happening because it's meant to happen? Uh, because um, the way Allah designed this, the end of times, is it, maybe it could potentially be that it's, it's coming. Or is it just a tragedy and we've... We as Muslims, we've failed ourselves and, and our brothers and sisters. I think these um, sort of end of times um, discussions are, are are one for the scholars to have. And the scholars have had these discussions in the past as well. We, you know, they thought end of times was happening 200 years ago. So whatever the indicators are that exist about these end of time debates, they're not, they're not uh, let's say, specific enough to be able to definitively say that a particular phase has occurred or not. That many mistakes have been made in the past. What it, what this is, in terms of your life and my life, is a test. Right? Everything that we do is a test. And this is a quite a tough test. And what this difficulty presents all of us is, what are we going to do about it? It doesn't matter what, what's going to happen tomorrow. Tomorrow, as we've seen, is not guaranteed for any of us. But what are you going to do about it today? What When you see these things, you know these things about... Um. Uh, an evil that's taking place and for anyone with any conscience that 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 i know that there are many people of conscience because i know a lot of people who haven't been sleeping very well since uh, october um maybe a majority of us and we all feel it and so it falls on us within our skill set and our resources and our ability to try and figure out something to do about it right? what can we actively do I mean, there's one aspect which is commercial, and then the other aspect, you know, political lobbying. So you obviously people are given money, right? 
And though, and that's translated into aid, and there are hundreds of trucks. Are these aids getting no, into? They're not getting into uh, Gaza. Like, uh, you need maybe five hundred trucks a day. Fifty are getting in. Right, children are starving, in in a way that I saw on my TV screen um, in the eighties during during Ethio- the Ethiopian famine, and that also was a fake or falsely engineered famine by war. Not that we knew that at the time, but um, that's what it was. And, and another one is occurring right now during Ramadan. Um, the aid isn't getting through. It's, it's being blocked by design by the Israelis. Um, we see starvation where before we saw limbs being blown apart. Will our money make any difference? Um, it, it may do in that it will add to a list of resources that will be available but aren't getting through. Now, really, the pressure needs to be put in the United States and in the United Kingdom, where Israel produces 20% of its weaponry. Uh, 80% comes from the United States. If the United States wanted Israel to stop doing what it's doing, it would just turn off the tap of, uh, of weapons being supplied uh, to them. So really, the pressure is there. Israel is controlled by a complete lunatic, which is Benjamin Netanyahu at the moment, Netanyahu was somebody who was facing criminal trial just before these events took place. He'd torn his own country apart in terms of uh, protests in the street before October. And so this is a a man on his last uh, legs trying to avoid prison for himself, and he's willing to burn his country in the process. Um, And our responsibility uh, is to stop him. And that, that, that is because... We have commitments, our countries have commitments to the Genocide Convention. Uh, the International Court of Justice has declared effectively that the it, what Israel is doing at the moment is plausibly a genocide. Um, and so the rest of the countries who have signed up to the Genocide Convention are under, frankly, a duty to try and stop it. And they're not doing so. And it's our political class that that is not doing, A, its duty legally, and B, um, the will of the people that it's supposed to represent. So, obviously, selling weapon is one aspect. Um, I guess moral or, or money support towards Israel is another thing. But then again, you've got our Muslim countries, neighboring countries. Like what? why are they? Why are they not? boycotting the way they should. I was in, I don't want to name the country because they might ban me from going and I do need, I do have business interests. I've been to countries in Middle East and there you, is nothing there. There is not even a single flag. Do you see what you just said? Yeah. You're not going to say something because it may affect your business interests. Yes. Right, that's you as an individual. Yes. The entire country, its leadership is thinking exactly that way as well. We're not going to do anything because it may affect our interests. Wow, this is this is this um, whatever that force is. Is this some kind of a Dajjalic uh, force or, or what is it? it? It seems so powerful. Like nobody wants to even dare to to speak up you against see, it. You see what happened? Even our Muslim countries. Well, I don't know if there are any Muslim countries, but the countries that appear to be Muslim. So in terms of geopolitics, the balance of power is the balance of destruction or the balance of um, mutual, mutual support. So you can do, it's a carrot and stick. You can, do the, you can encourage people with carrot, like if we work together, you're going to improve the lot of both of you. It's a win-win, like the sort of Chinese proposition to the world, as they say. Or, uh, or it's uh, if you don't do what we want, we're going to flatten your country, like Gaza, like Syria, like wow. Iraq, like Afghanistan. Right, so that's the carrot and stick approach. It, it, Israel's shown its capability, with the help of the Americans, for flattening and literally flattening a, a region. But the other countries around it, um, the only industrialized countries is Iran and a little bit of Syria, not really, but Iran. Um, every other country that had the potential for being industrialized either isn't industrialized by agreement, so that's why Saudi Arabia, Jordan, they don't have an industrial base, why? Because the Americans, um, they know that if a country has an industrial base, then it has the capability of producing its own weapons, um, which is a challenge. So the Turks have an industrial base. They're producing drones now. They're working with the Israelis in Azerbaijan with their drone technology. Um, 
and Iraq had an industrial base, it was blown to smithereens. Syria was developing an industrial base, it was blown to smithereens. Um, you know, Libya was developing an industrial base, blown to smithereens. So Israel likes to say that it's the only you know country in that region that is developing. That's only because the other ones keep getting blown up by uh, their American friends, really. Um, so I- Iran still is there with a with a industrial base and. It has the capability, which it has shown through its um, uh, various organizations, one of which is Hezbollah, to produce a response of a kind to the similar to, to, to Israel. Uh, so Israel doesn't, doesn't attack Iran directly. They have these proxy wars instead. So the reality is, is that why do the other countries not, not do anything? Well, A, they don't have the industrial base too, which is why they, they buy the weapons from Britain or America and B, that they've agreed to be in that subservient position because their existential existence relies upon U.S. and America. Now, if U.S. and America decide that it is too much what Israel's done, stop it. <laughs> Believe you me, you'll see all these countries suddenly appear and get all vocal and powerful because they're <laughs> masters of said so. Yeah, but, wow, uh, wow. So there's so much to talk about. It's so fascinating. Geopolitics, you know... Your, your field of work, all, all uh, subjects that fascinate me a lot. And, and inshallah, we, we, we hope to have another conversation f- uh, further down the line this year um, in terms of how you got on with your political campaigning. Now, talk to us about why you're so angry with our current MP, Rushnara Ali. So Rushnara Ali is um, a British Bangladeshi, highly educated and from a very you know, humble background. Uh, it's laudable that she managed to pull herself up from her bootstrings and achieve greatly in, in academia. Um, our community spent treasure and time in making sure that she, reflective of our community, was our was our representative MP in Parliament. She was meant to be Bethnal Green's representative in Parliament. In 2009, she spoke about her commitment to the Palestinian cause, that she would be with them forever. And since 2009, we had 2014, where Israel attacked the Palestinians, uh, and we marched in the streets of London, and she wasn't there. You know, in 2021, Israel again attacked um, you know, uh, Palestine in a way that was fundamentally offensive to the world. We marched, and she wasn't there. Fine. Maybe she was busy. Um In that time, from 2014 to now, uh, she had constituents who, children who were lost to a war in Syria. She hasn't called their families. Not even now in nine years. She hasn't done anything. She hasn't done a serious case review or asked for a serious case review um, for lessons learned around this. So her own individual constituency has done nothing for. And the commitment she had to the Palestinians, she abandoned because when she was given the crucial opportunity to do something about a genocide unfolding, she decided to abstain. And that was a betrayal. Now, she's not known for being in her office. She's never in her office. She's not known for answering her emails or her call. It's very difficult for her constituents to even get hold of her. Fine, they tolerated that because she's from the community. But to betray on a fundamental principle, we are, I had no interest in politics. Um, I was outside her office. Uh, protesting to make sure she just said something. I went there for week after week after week. Nothing. She was not. She wasn't even willing to say something. It wouldn't have mattered. It wouldn't have made any difference. In all truth and honesty, Israel's not going to listen to what uh, Rishnar Ali is going to say. You know. But the fact is, is that she would be doing her job. Then she'd be representing our will, and she couldn't even do that. If a politician's job is to say something, then say something. That's your job. But she wouldn't do that. And um, and and that's unacceptable. Is that true? And and probably a rumor, um, but sometimes rumors are true that her husband is a Israeli or or, or Jewish or something like that. I have no idea about that, mm-hmm. um, and I don't look into people's personal backgrounds. We didn't. But could it be? Could it? Could it be I, I, that I, trigger? I'm actually fundamentally against. Speak people speaking about pe- uh, politicians' families, okay. you know, and the reason is, is we didn't elect their families; we elected them, 
their responsibility. But surely we have to look at what influences them and their shape and, and it shapes their thinking. Like for example, me in my household, my wife is my wife, mm-hmm. and she has immense influence over my how I make decisions, how I see certain things. You're a company owner. You have a successful company. Yeah. If I wanted to invest in your company, would you be open to that? As a structure, no, 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 not at the moment right. because that's you, not. But if you were, how would you think um, about me looking into your wife? Yeah, I want to invest in your company. You're the CEO. You're making decisions. But I'm going to examine your wife and see what your relationship is with her. But because you've kind of come to me, you've already made that decision that I'm doing something right. I'm performing well. My balance sheet is looking good. That's why you don't really need to look too behind. Uh, <laughs> Do I not? <laughs> you don't what, because what, because what? I've already pr- produced results. Mm-hmm. However, on this case, in the case of what we, the, the context of what we're discussing, mm-hmm. there has been no results, as you've said, 20, that, that 2009, is, 2014. That is, that, is her, that is her balance sheet. Yeah, that is Rushnara's balance sheet. No results. No yeah. results. So that I don't need to look into her family dynamic because her family are not responsible for what she does. You know, in my family, there are a range of views about what I do or what I don't do. It's none of their business, my family's business, right? It's because I'm responsible for what I choose to do and choose not to do. So you're holding her accountable? That's the only person that is accountable. For for, for her, her not speaking up, for her, for very people that went and campaigned and lobbied and done, or what's that, uh, you know, when you do leading up to the canvas. Campaign, can, yeah. Can, yeah. But she... What you're saying is she she turned her back she against, turned her back, against yeah. them. So wh- how do you how are you going to be different? Because the way the my fear is towards you is the force is so vast. Somehow either they'll do something and they'll try and find something about you. I'm sure they won't because you're a, you're a lawyer. You're going to defend yourself even if there's lies made about you. But don't you think that force is so big? I mean, how much difference can you make? We don't make a difference. We make effort, right? Okay. The results in the hands of Allah. So, what's your campaign? What's what's the what's the what's the message? What are we what are we going for? What are we going to see? Dif- if I, as a as a constituent, potential constituent, mm-hmm. I voted for Taz, what's what? Well, that's it? not my name on the ballot paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Tasnim, Tasnim right. Akunji. We offer an option, which the, the electorate in this country haven't had before. They've had the choice between conservative, Labour and Liberal Democrat. And what, what Gaza shows is that actually those are not different. You know, they're all the same thing. Like Model T Ford, he said, you can have any car you want in any colour as long as it's black. Right? <laughs> so conservative, Labour and Liberal Democrat, you can have any politics you want as long as it's neoliberalism as long as it means the foreign policy of this country stays the same. And that's been proved. That's not a choice when it matters. And what we say is the independent movements, independents in any constituency are the people who have now come up to offer you a choice to step away from that monopoly. We don't allow monopolies in business. You'll know that. The reason we don't is because monopolies lead to abuse. You, a, a company will abuse its customer, it will abuse the rules, it will get away with it. But we've allowed for monopolies to exist in our politics. And that's why we find ourselves taken for granted and, and, and effectively abused. So what we offer is a choice. And the difference is, quite easily, in Rishnara's case, is A, we'll be here. You will see us. You don't see her. Yeah? We are accountable to our electorate because we're not part of a political party who's going to formulate a manifesto and shove it down the throats of every resident, you know, in 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 our constituency, it's the other way around. So where Rishnara is is effectively Keir Starmer's representative in Bethnal Green, we will be Bethnal Green and Stepney's representative in Parliament, which is the way it should be. So, what do potential voters need to do to support Tasnim Akunji? Well, potential voters a need to register to vote. Because uh, if you're over 18, you're a citizen of this country, um, and you believe that you've not been represented by any political body before, this is the time where we need to make a difference. This is different now. In the past, people have thought, what's the point of voting? They're all the same, you know. 
And that's why they don't bother to register to vote, and that's why we have a low voter turnout. And they're not wrong. They were all the same. Okay, well, I've registered. What else? What else do I need to do? Uh, well, what we'd hope you'd do, uh, in our case, is to come and join our team, uh, basically speak to us, see what we're about. How do we join? Is there a website? or? or? There will be shortly. Okay. Uh, but we have our people in the community. You found me. Uh, Alhamdulillah, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. And, um, and yeah, the, the, we're moving that quite quickly on. Uh, we will have a website, but you can join me on Twitter and talk to me via that. Um, it's at Mohamed Akunji on, on X. Uh, I'm dead naming it, aren't I? <laughs> so anyone that has any, a skill set mm -hmm. can reach out to you to to support you, whether it's a creative person, person who develops a website, some anyone that can offer no, value. Not, that you not, you, not you need those type of people or that, you just need the votes? No, no, we need that. And actually what we want is people who have an interest in the problems in the community. Like the community knows its problems. So, and a lot of us know our own solutions. We don't know everything, right? So we want people to come forward and tell us what's their specialist interest, what have they seen that's gone wrong in the community, um, and what do they think the solutions are. The whole point of us being independent is so that we can listen. And we have two ears and one mouth, and I, employ, I intend to employ that in those proportions. We want to listen twice to the community, and then we want to formulate our manifesto based upon what we hear. Taz, bye. Honestly, there's so much to talk about, but um, it's been an hour and a half. Can, oh, you, can wow. you believe it? Um, let's end with a quick fire question. Job for a day, what would it be? That's not your current job. Lion tamer. Wow. <laughs> it, sure, it tells a lot about you. <laughs> um, last thing that you do before going to bed. I'll pray. And your favourite holiday destination? It's been Bosnia. Yeah, I love that country too. I've been mm. there. Um, and your dream car? I don't have one. Surely, come on. I really don't care about cars. <laughs> yeah. Taz, thank you so much for coming no in. And, and we look forward to continue our conversation offline. Pleasure. Thank you.